Hello and <clears throat> most welcome to 699. Let me just adjust the mobile a bit here. Let's see here. Something like this. And action. I'm in the woods outside my home in Hissingen called the Keeles Park or the Hissings Park. And it's Rombergs Park. Sorry, Rombergs Park. It's a very lovely area. And today we're having a, a light snowfall. Not much. Degrees around one minus. Typical for November or the end of November, I would say. Uh, today I would like to continue as I started a couple of weeks ago. Ashish Dalila and his 10 essays, essays on science and religion named Is the Apple Really Red? And we are now at chapter 5 named Einstein's Religion. Give me a second. the mobile sorry about that just the mobile should be turned off Oh dear God, sorry. Sorry about that. Not very professional, <coughs> but I have to blame it's Sunday and it's cold. Einstein once said that if there is a religion that corresponds to the needs of science, it would be Buddhism. Why Buddhism? That is because Buddhism, there is no soul nor God. The ultimate reality is void, which would resonate with the scientific idea that the universe springs from a space-time vacuum. In Einstein's theory of relativity, matter emerges emerges from the curvature in space-time and to produce matter curvature has to be added to space-time. Similarly in atomic theory quantum particles are created from the fluctuations of vacuum. These fluctuations cannot at present be predicted although the theory says they are probable. How this probability becomes a reality requires the addition of something that does not presently exist within science. Uh, and here is an adding. Uh, the standard interpretation of quantum theory requires a collapse postulate that converts the probabilities into reality. There are hence many New Age philosophies which begin with by supposing a vacuum of space-time along with a universal quantum wave function from which the universe springs. This kind of religion is impersonalistic or voidistic, but it gels well with the scientific materialism. And hence some religiously inclined people, like Einstein, suppose that this may be the meeting point between religion and science, not the ones that postulate God. What are impersonalism and voidism? In the personalist religions which postulate that God is a person, the form in nature is produced by God. There are different variations of this idea, some in which God is the creator of form, such as the Abrahamic religions, 
and other others such as Vedic philosophy in which form emerges from the body of God in the act of self-consciousness. Uh, regardless of how you suppose the form is produced, its, its cause is traced back to an original being. Modern science has a considerable problem, has considerable problems with postulating such a being, because it stemmed from a conflict with religion, especially the Abrahamic religions. Conversely, the idea that form can emerge from a formless from the formless is much more acceptable in science, because it requires no God. This is precisely the reason why scientists are attracted to the philosophies of impersonalism and voidism, which claim that the ultimate reality is formless, and forms are emergent and temporary effects. Uh, when reality is in identified as formless space-time and the universal quantum wave function, all forms that emerges from this are fleeting. And that goes well with the idea that the material world is ever-changing and not eternal. The reality is something from which it produced and therefore the phenomena are illusions. Impersonalism and voidism claim that the ultimate reality is formless. Impersonalism claims that the ultimate re reality is a non-dual substance in which the duality of form does not exist. Voidism claims that the ultimate reality is nothingness in which the non-dual substance is also discarded. While impersonalism regards the non-dual reality as consciousness, voidism denies even the existence of consciousness. In voidism there is no experiencer beyond the experience. Both the experiencer and the experience are created simultaneously. Both the experiencer and the experience are created simultaneously. In recent times, many attempts to bring science and religion together have been motivated from the impersonalist and voidist philosophical stances. Buddhism is a philosophy of voidism, while Advaita Vedanta is a philosophy of impersonalism. On the fact of it, there is tremendous synergy between science and these ideologies of formless, because science too tries to describe the ultimate reality as a formless vacuum. In both cases, forms are emergent rather than fundamental properties of nature. However, once you acknowledge that ultimate reality is formless, it hardly matters whether you call it space-time, nothingness or oneness. These are more or less equivalent formulation, formulations of the same basic idea. In Indian philosophy, impersonalism, the idea that there is an ultimate formless reality, arose in the philosophy of the great savant, Sankarachara, who produced an interpretation of Vedanta Sutra, the summarized conclusions of the Vedas. 
arguing that Brahman is real while this world is unreal. Impersonalists quote the Vedantic aphorism Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya, implying that Brahman is real while the manifest universe is of different forms is unreal. Since the experience of the individuality of the observers is also part of the worldly experience, the impersonalist claims that the distinction between observers is false. There is hence only a single existence that is segregated into many observers and their experiences. And this separation is an illusion. Only the single existence that exists prior to the creation of many observers is therefore real. Sankaracharya impersonalism was a response to the inroads that Buddhism was making in Indian society around the 8th century AD. Buddhism had criticized the ramp, ramp, rampant ritualism often with a profound philosophical grounding prevalent in Indian society at that time. But in thus criticizing the Vedic religion, Buddhism gradually undermined the authority of the Vedas themselves. Centuries later, Sankaracharya revived the Vedic religion's philosophy, restoring the authorities of the Vedas, although he also rejected the practices of rituals. His work led to a new interpretation of Vedanta Sutra in which ultimate reality is conceived as being formless and impersonal. Well, uh, that's almost a book uh, about that author, uh, English woman who wrote about Buddhism and in, uh, Hinduism and yoga. Very interesting. Uh, we are not really aware of this exchange in India at that time in the Western countries, but it was a developing new religion. Buddhism made an exchange with the Vedic tradition and the great discussion emerged with both uh, uh, the variants become, became affected. Uh, Buddhism had claimed that both the observer and the observed are unreal and to know reality one must know the emptiness in which neither subject nor object are real. Sankaracharya reinstated the existence of a transcendental subject without rescuing the material world from non-existence. But how much better is the undivided oneness of a transcendental observer than the emptiness of space-time is questionable. If you cannot use distinction, you cannot use language, it may not mean that oneness and nothingness are unreal. However, it does mean that we can't speak about them using language in the conventional sense, because every word or sound represents a form, and the referred object must have, an, have a form. So, you can compare impersonalism and voidism with modern science. Here, only matter is real, and the observers, although conscious, are also material. In the thinking about observers today, consciousness is an attribute of brains. Although what make the brain conscious is still not known, the belief is that this ideology, when pursued, will give us the answers. Both observers and the phenomena they observe in science are this worldly and not otherworldly. Furthermore, matter is not fundamental, though rather the differences between objects are produced from an undifferentiated space time. What causes their production remains an unsolved problem in science. There is hence a considerable philosophical synergy between the ideas of impersonalism 
voidism and materialism in modern science. However, the similarity between the three viewpoints also implies that they inherit the common problem of converting the formless into something with form. The formless is undivided and undifferentiated, while things with form are divided and differentiated. The problem of form can therefore also be stated as the problem of how a singular reality becomes differentiated into individual objects with form. Only when reality is differentiated, differentiated can, be, can be it known. spoken about and described in language. Materialism, impersonalism and voidism do not explain the advent of form. Very true. There are similarities between voidism, where the ultimate reality is a void or nothingness. Impersonalism, where the ultimate reality is an indifferented oneness. And scientific materialism, where the ultimate reality is space-time, have prompted some scientists like Einstein and New Age spiritualists like Deepak Chopra to see these parallels as avenues for reconciling the materialism in science with the mysticism in religions. I think Sam Harris should be nam named in that context as well and his wife Annika. These attempts at reconciliation, however, can get very confusing for many scientists and spiritualists alike. For instance, if reality is ultimately formless and living beings are accidents of the conversion of formlessness into form, then the practice of religion is an accident of nature as well. Why would we treat the religious experience as something profound if we don't treat the mundane experience as being equally profound. And now we're coming to the problem of impersonalism and voidism. The central difficulty in the philosophies of impersonalism and voidism is the inability to explain how the manifested world of forms is created from the formless. For instance, if the universe prior to uh, creation of oneness is oneness, then how is that oneness divided into many parts? If the universe is emptiness prior to creation, then what converts this emptiness into objects? The scientific counterpart of these questions is if space-time is, is the fundamental entity from which the universe springs, then what causes the random fluctuation in that space-time? Which in turn causes the manifest universe? Without such an explanation, the theory, theory of nature is incomplete because it cannot explain the origin of form from the formless. It is not sufficient to say that there is a me mechanism by which something can happen. It, also, it is also necessary to provide the cause that employs the mechanism. Random fluctuations are a mechanism by which form can be created but without the cause which triggers them, the answer is incomplete. In recent times, there have been attempts to solve this problem by postulating consciousness as a transcendent entity that creates the forms. For instance, some New Age thinkers claim that nature is a quantum probability wave function 
that consciousness collapses into and that define definite states of its collapses into definite states out of its choices this consciousness the spiritualist claims is the impersonal cosmic consciousness the field of choices in which the world of experience is created but this idea of a cosmic impersonal consciousness is a misnomer because the idea of choice and the idea of oneness are incompatible. Choices imply individuality, and if consciousness can choose, then it must be an individual. Very good point. Choices without individuality cannot exist because choice will have no disposition, i.e how to choose one over the other. However, without the notion of a transcendent consciousness, there is no explanation for the emergence of form from the formless. In that scenario, the scientific explanation of nature is incomplete. Science is already being stalked by problems of incompleteness and inconsistency, which spirituality is supposed to solve. For if science was already complete and consistent, then there would be no need for a spiritual alternative. By adopting impersonal and voidistic approaches, however, we again inherit problems of inconsistency and incompleteness, this time from the spiritual philosophy. It has become customary in science to attribute anything that the scientific theory cannot explain to randoms, randomness. Thus space-time can randomly produce particles. These randomly created particles can randomly combine to form complex molecules which can randomly combine to produce living beings. By injecting the idea of randomness into logical empirical explanation of nature, with such theories violate the fundamental goal in science, which is to provide predictable cause, effect relationship and predictions. Those who propose randomness as an explanation of currently unexplained facts believe that they are proposing a unique scientific idea, but a closer look reveals that they are proposing infinite unique ideas. Infinite unique ideas. It's a bit of the problem of Bertrand Russell once more. So they cannot explain where all those infinite unique ideas are stemming from. Most impersonalist and voidist religious philosophies ride on this dogmatic approach to science. Just as matter can emerge from the collapse of the wave function or the changes to geometry of the space time in physical theories, impersonalism and voidism suggest that forms are created from something formless. While claiming to be to provide a synthesis of science and religion in so far as the problem about the conversion of formless form to uh, to form is concerned we will not have to 
we would not have moved an inch in neither religion nor science. Religion just become an unnecessary addendum to science because it provides no logic of values in terms of formulating new scientific theories. And that criticism goes for modern religion in Sweden and the Western world as well. They try to be a sort of addendum to help to explain where are the spiritual side of reality. But by indirectly accepting the scientific standpoint of voidism or impersonalism, they end up in the problem of having to explain what indeed is form. And this is exactly the same problem that Bertrand Russell ended up. He tried to explain form by property. And he tried to elude the problem by saying property sort of emerges from sets. But he could never explain how can form come from nothing. How is that possible? That he never explained. And whereas it's a failed logical uh, solution to a problem uh, or a logic solution, it goes to show very clearly what the problem is. The problem is how does form and distinction come from this formlessness, come from this complete void of things. It's a rather important problem and it's hardly ever addressed in Western cultures. That's why Ashish is so good. There are some philosophers that try to solve this problem indirectly after this proposition of formlessness already is accepted indirectly or inherently. But we have no claim on the idea that the universe is formless or impersonal as well. That's a position that needs to be defended and I see very little, if any, defense for that idea. So let me come to the next level here. And now it's called form and personalism. There's another school of Indian philosophy, much older than both Buddhism and impersonalism, that provides a radically different view of creation. In this view, there are two things, matter and consciousness, which combine to create the universe. Both have the same type of form compromising free aspects. Uh, we have discussed the free aspects of souls earlier as Satchit Ananda. The same form is also reflected in matter, producing three categories of material reality that corresponds to the three aspects of the soul. Our conscious experiences and the material phenomena are the outcome of the separation of these form followed by their combination. For example, in in the case of matter, these three forms are cognition, emotion and relation. The term cognition represents all the concepts which build the body and the mind. The term emotion refers to a material personality that gives rise to desires, dislikes, dislikes, and etc. The term relation refers to the roles these objects play contextually. However, there is also a primordial state of both matter and consciousness in which the, these three aspects are not differentiated. This state consciousness exists as oneness and matter exists as nothingness. In the state of oneness the different individual souls are not differentiated from each other i.e. they are not conscious of the distinction from each other. They just exist without awareness of their individuality. Similarly in the state of nothingness the forms in matter are not differentiated just like zero is the sum of all opposites, and yet the opposites exist inside zero. Similarly, the duality of material nature is risk reconciled in the state of nothingness.
These are also called the unmanifest state of matter and consciousness. Hmm. Well, that's, it is quite different. The philosophy of impersonalism corresponds to the undifferentiated state of consciousness, and the philosophy of voidism corresponds to the undifferentiated state of matter. They are both acknowledged in Vedic philosophy, but they are not considered the ultimate reality, because there is another transcendent reality that is always manifest, although it's not, it is non-dual i.e. not compromised of oppositions. The undifferentiated state of consciousness is called Brahman and the undifferent state of matter is called Pradana. In the manifest state Brahman becomes the numerous individual souls aware of their individuality. Similarly in the manifest state Pradana is called Prakriti compromising three modes of nature. Therefore, in one sense, the forms emerges from the formless. But in another sense, these forms were pre-existent, although the three modes of nature were coalesced into pradana and the numerous individual souls were unaware of their individuality. The philosophies of impersonism and voidism are not false but they are theories about existence prior to the manifestation of the material world. The main reason these are not considered supreme is that there is a transcend transcendent nature in which these forms exist in manifest forms. So if you call the unmanifest reality as the supreme existence, you are right in terms of the origin of the material world, but wrong in the ultimate sense of what lies beyond matter. <clears throat> this school of thought is sometimes called the personist school in Indian philosophy, because each soul is an individual. The individuality simply means that there is a predisposition towards choices. So every soul has a form which constitutes its original personality from which soul has a form. Which constitutes its original personality from which bring desires, likes and dislikes. This in turn dictates the choices the soul makes, and they can be called its free will. However, the nature of free will is that you can suspend or surrender it.
in the transcendent in the transcendent world this free will is surrendered to god put some gloves on So even if free will will exist, it's subordinated to the free will of God. In the Brahman state, the free will is suspended, i.e. not used, and the soul becomes unaware of its individuality. This doesn't mean that the soul is no longer an individual. It is just that it's unaware of its individuality, not using its free will to make conscious decisions. This suspension of free will is different from the illusion of free will. If there is a free will to begin with, then it can be suspended to create oneness. But if there is no free will then it cannot be created from oneness. If individuality is fundamental, then it can create oneness. But if oneness is fundamental, then it cannot create individuality. In the personal school, therefore, individuality is said to be fundamental from which oneness is created when the living beings chooses to discard its own free will. The idea of free will is not reducible, hmm. neither to matter nor to an undivided being. It cannot be reduced to matter because free will can create new ideas, while matter cannot produce anything new. Matter can only be transformed from one state to another, since free will can produce new information while matter cannot, free will cannot be material. While a living being may temporarily suspend its free will and thereby merge into the oneness of, of a unified existence, this free will remains an innate property that can spring forth at any time. The state of oneness is therefore temporary, while free will is eternal. If you have free will, you can give it up, but if you don't have free will, you cannot create it. The paradox of form in impersonalism, voidism and materialism cannot be solved because they attempt to create form from formlessness. The personalist views, view postulates that form exists as individual conscious beings whose free will is the symptom of their individuality. A conscious, a conscious being chooses to become conscious of the world and can also withdraw from the world. The impersonalist notion of an impersonal and formless consciousness that is devoid of free will and individuality is therefore a misnomer.
all conscious beings must have a form, although by suspending that individuality, a soul can be merged into a formless existence. And now we're coming to forms and choices. Every form is therefore eternal, however, it may not always be manifest. These forms are manifest due to choices. Choices individuate a formless existence into a person and then objectify this personality into self-identity, intents, concepts, sensations and things. The living being is said to be caught in the material world, but this world is compared to a web that a sp spider has produced produce out of itself. Through its choices, the living being engages itself into material identity, intelligence, mind, senses, and finally a material body. The impersonalists jump at this problem and claim that since the root of the problem is the use of free will, we must discard the free will and merge into a single, undivided, undifferentiated oneness. The personalist, however, claims that the free will cannot be discarded. It can temporarily be suspended, but it will rise again and engage the living being unless it's used in a new way. Spirituality in Vedic philosophy begins with the idea that there are uses of the free will that do not engage it. While a detailed description of this use of free will is out of the scope of this book, the fundamental point that I want to make here is that the forms in nature are not emergent properties. They are rather an eternal, fundamental property. Form can be suspended when free will is suspended, and the world returns to being formless. But form cannot be created from the formless. Ideas about formlessness in impersonalism, voidism and materialism have a challenge on their hands, namely to explain the emergence of form from the formless. Postulating that form is created due to randomness in nature cannot be regarded as an explanation. Harsh words. We can pretend that randomness is a scientific idea, but such theories will in the future be suspended by others that actually describe form in new ways. Uh, in the next chapter there will be a discussion between the relation between form and science uh, and how ideas about form can and will transform science in unprecedented ways. The key takeaway from here that I wish to highlight is that impersonalism and voidism add nothing to science that science is not already doing through its materialistic ideology. Impersonalism and voidism are pseudo-spiritual reinterpretations of the material philosophy in science. Do we really need them to augment science? I personally don't think so. The personalist, is, the personalist approach appears to be much more interesting because it indicates that all form is eternal, but it exists as an unmanifest form. In a modern terminology, we can say that form exists as a possibility 
from which a reality is created by choice. We cannot observe this possibility qua possibility. And therefore it appears that the world is a formless because it is not being observed. We can, however, explain the emergence of form from the possibility. Similarly, the universe of objects is dissolved into an undifferentiated material existence when consciousness stops its conscious choices. When form is destroyed, the objects are unmanifest and cannot be known. However, since the soul is never destroyed, it can create form again. The total amount of matter when the universe manifests is equal to the total amount of matter when the universe does not exist. The difference between the existence and non-existence of the universe is the total amount of information that is added to undifferentiated matter to produce a cosmos of individual objects. Choices are therefore responsible not for creation of the world but for differentiating the pre-existing world into phenomena. Coming up here. If information is the byproduct of randomness in emptiness, we wouldn't be able to causally explain the origin of information. If information or rhythm existed in matter and consciousness experiences it, then we would not be able to explain why information is semantic. It is only when information originates in consciousness and is then objectified in matter that we can causally explain the origin of information as well as why this information must be semantic. Well, it's an incredibly good point as always, Ashish. Thank you very much. Formlessness does not produce form. Formlessness does not produce language, semantics, different, uh, differentiation. Actually, what can come up out of formlessness is a pre-state, I'd say. But form is something fundamental. Distinction is something fundamental. Words are fundamental. That's the point in a nutshell. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this was rather interesting. Bye-bye.